Good morning. Anyone want to talk about sex? Yeah, I can see you guys are so enthusiastic about it. Um, a few months ago, there was there's an actor and a comedian named Aziz Ansari. This was right about the time that the whole Me Too movement was getting started, and it was coming out that there were a lot of men who were abusing their power and, and sexually abusing women. And, um, and it, it came out at that time that there was this, uh, this actor, Aziz Ansari, was on a date with actually a coworker, and he thought the date was going really well, and they ended up going back to his apartment, and this is kind of how things go these days, it seems, and uh, they ended up messing around a little bit, and from my understanding, they, they ended up having sex. Well, he thought the whole thing was consensual, but a few months later, the woman wrote an article in an online magazine, I guess you would call it, not using her name, but using his name, and essentially saying that even though he thought it was consensual, that she essentially thought that it was, that it was sexual assault because she had felt pressured into it. She felt like she couldn't say no. Well, I'm not going to go into this particular incident, but during that time, while that incident was happening, um, I saw a sketch on Saturday Night Live that I thought pretty well summed up the climate when it comes to talking about any of these kinds of issues, whether it comes to sex or gender or really many things in our society, and I thought it perfectly summed up how a lot of people feel about it. I want you to watch. All right. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to talk about it, all right? I hope that's okay with you because we, I think we need to talk about it. This is one of the, one of the topics that is kind of the most controversial, one of the hottest topics that we have in our day, and I think the church needs to talk about it because the truth of the matter is, is that the Bible actually has a lot to say about things like sex and gender, but oftentimes it's not what people want to hear. And, uh, and so oftentimes we just keep quiet about it. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to, you know, share unpopular opinions. But I believe that as the church, and especially as our kids are growing up in the church, we need to have a, a, a sort of um, a foundation, a guiding foundation to help them, um, to help them navigate all of these issues. Now, <clears throat> there's actually some un misunderstanding about what the Bible actually teaches about sex and sexuality. And the misunderstanding comes from the fact that there are a lot of people who believe um, that the Bible only gives us a list of rules when it comes to sex. So for instance, don't have sex outside of marriage, don't have sex with a close relative, don't have sex with animals, don't have sex with children, don't have sex with someone of the same sex. And we think that that's really all that, that, uh, that Christianity, all that the Bible has to say about sex. And, and so there are so many Christians who are out, or many people who are outside the church who believe that Christians are at best hopelessly old-fashioned and out of date, or at worst, as, um, at the same level as racists. They're bigots, and, and they're only motivated by their hatred for sexual or gender minorities, and, uh, and that we uphold gender norms only to prop up the patriarchy and, uh, and devalue women. Now, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there are some Christians who truly are bigots, all right? And just to be clear, we don't promote or allow bigotry in any form, whether it's race or sexual orientation or whatever. I don't think that's, that's right even for, for, for anyone who calls himself a Christian. Uh, but Christians who hold to traditional biblical views of sexuality and gender in large part are not motivated by, by hatred, but they, what they want to do is they want to be faithful to the biblical uh, scriptural account. And, uh, and oftentimes, Christian beliefs seem so strange to the world outside is because we're trying to apply biblical rules to a, sexual, to a, a secular anthropology. Okay, now don't be scared by that word anthropology, okay? Anthropology is just a word for understanding how, how we understand human beings, right? How do we understand human beings? 
Um, who are we? Why are we here? Are we an accident or are we, like we've talked about over the course of this year, are we a masterpiece of a loving creator? Um, and then it branches out into other questions like, are things the way they're supposed to be or is there something wrong with the world? Is it broken in some way? Um, and how we answer those foundational questions will go a long way toward showing us or telling us how we will view sex and gender roles and gender and sexual morality. And, uh, and, and so people today make a lot of the fact that, that public opinion is changing on this matter. Okay? There are a lot of people who are, are moving away from the traditional biblical understanding of sex and sexuality, uh, but the truth of the matter is, is our morality cannot be based on popular opinion. Okay? It has to be based on a consistent understanding of human nature, on a biblical understanding of, of human nature. And so <clears throat> we actually live in a society that doesn't have consistent answers to these foundational questions. And this is one of the reasons why there's so much chaos and so much confusion around, around sexual issues is because there's not one answer, there's not one foundation for how people think about sex and, and gender. It's all over the place. And so you can't say that any of the debates that go on are simply debates between Christians and gay activists or Christians and feminists. Today you have second wave feminists versus third wave feminists. You have trans activists versus feminists and vice versa. It's gender non-binary people against people who say that, that gender is only male and female. It's sex and gender essentialists versus social constructionists. It's everyone against gray-haired, straight, cisgendered, sex negative, body negative, conservative white males. Did I, uh, did I leave anybody out? Okay. <laughs> And, and, if you don't, and if you don't understand what many of those things mean, then you're not alone, okay? But there are debates that are happening all throughout our society, and the point that I'm making here is not to make you cynical, and it's not to get you fired up to go to the coffee shop tomorrow and talk about how stupid everyone else is and, and try to fight some kind of culture war, okay? We're not into culture wars here, okay? But I bring it up. Because it would be really easy to set up a straw man in society and say, well, society believes this. But the truth is, is that there is no one thing that society believes. And that's why we have so much chaos is because so many people are coming from a different foundation that it's hard to really even wrap your mind around everything that people believe about, about sex and gender. But the truth of the matter is, is that most people are not activists. Most people are just like you and me trying to figure this stuff out as we go, okay? And it's a confusing time. And so we have to be willing to give people the grace that we want them to give to us, and we have to be willing to talk to people. And we have to be willing to, to even talk to people who are different, who believe differently than we are, and, and to give them grace as well, okay? Now, there are many people who believe that if we were just to knock down the traditional boundaries of sex and gender, then, and, and just um, encourage everyone to do what their heart desires or what they feel, then everyone will be happier. But the problem is, is that over the last 50 or 60 years, those walls have been coming down, and they just continue to accelerate even more as they're coming down. And yet it seems like people are not getting happier. They're actually getting more depressed about it and more confused about it. We're not getting more clarity, we're actually getting less clarity. And, and the reason why really makes sense, and let me um, illustrate it by, by using this sort of mind, um, I guess, experiment, I guess. I, um, I'm really tired of the, uh, the grid system on the streets of Minneapolis. Aren't you tired of the grid system? I mean, if I wanted to go to Cub, why shouldn't I just be able to drive straight to Cub? I could save so much time, I could save so many miles in getting places if I, could just, if I didn't have to be limited by the roads, okay? And yet, we, for some reason, follow the plans that some city planner 80 years ago made up. I mean, how archaic is that? Okay, we follow all these roads and things, and, and people build their houses, you know, in different places. We should just be able to drive where we want. We should be able to build our houses where we want. And don't you think everything would just be so much better if we would just get rid of all the roads and things? 
Okay. All right, so do you see where I'm going with this? Okay, you guys know that it wouldn't actually be better, it would be worse. It wouldn't be easier to navigate, it would be harder. It wouldn't be more, the city wouldn't be more beautiful, it would actually be more confusing. And, and I know that rules can sometimes be oppressive and suffocating, but purpose and structure don't limit freedom, they actually allow it. Okay, they allow us to be able to, to move freely in, in coordination with other people in the society. And, and so the current deconstruction of sex and gender and the way that we've thought about people and our bodies isn't necessarily making things better because these matters are not private matters, okay? They're societal matters, okay? So it's not going to do for us today to just talk about the rules about sex and why the Bible has certain rules about it. We actually have to go to the foundation of who the Bible says we are. And, and, and again, I don't want, this is not to give you ammunition to argue with people. But what I want to do is I want to give you tools to be able to think biblically about things like sex and gender, not so that we can impose them on someone else, but so we can get our stuff together. And that's where it has to start, is we have to apply this stuff to ourselves first. And so we have to think about how, men, how should men think about women? How should women think about men? How do we get our own marriages together? so that we can live faithfully to what God has called us. And, and more than anything, what I want you to see throughout this process is, is that the biblical teachings on sex are not just about strict and oppressive rules. They're actually, it's, it's the foundation story. They're, they're about the beauty and the wonder of God's creation, about our, our sexed bodies and how Scripture provides us with a holistic way of thinking about human flourishing. And so with that in mind... I want to turn to Genesis chapter 1. Okay, so if you have your Bible with you, turn there with me. And uh, if you don't, there should be pew Bibles there um, in front of you, the red Bibles. And it's Genesis chapter 1. It's like the first page there. Um, so turn there with me. And, uh, and let's take a look at some of these uh, foundational issues uh, around sex and gender. Now, the creation story is not a story that is primarily about uh, science. I know that there are a lot of people who want to make it into a modern science manual, but it's really, they, when they wrote Genesis, they weren't concerned about the things that we are concerned about. So it's not really a science manual, but, it, but it's there to tell us who we are and why, we're, we, why we were created, what's our relationship with our creator. So it answers all of those foundational questions. And so that's where we go to find answers to these questions. Now, <clears throat> the story of Genesis begins right in the beginning beginning, and it tells us in Genesis chapter 2 that the earth was formless, and I think most translations will say formless and void, but the, in essence, it is empty and dark. And, and c commentators will say that this is, uh, this is where it's saying that, uh, that everything at the beginning, even after God had created matter, everything was just sort of chaos. Um, in other words, there's no order, there's no purpose, and because of that, the world is not inhabitable, okay? We can't make sense of it as humans when things are so chaotic. And so God started to sort all this stuff out, and he did it by separating things, all right? And so we see in, uh, in verse 4, for instance, he separates the light from the darkness, separates the day from the night. In verse 6, he separates the waters above from the waters below, and he separates the land from the, the, the sea. Um, and, and so basically what you see here is God is ordering the universe by separating things, okay? By distinguishing them for, from each other. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but this is actually how we have to make sense of the world. We have to separate things. We have to distinguish them to make sense of things. And so I have a 13-year-old granddaughter, and if we want to teach her her colors, what we have to do is, is we have to, 13 month, 13 month old, yeah. All right, let me take it, let me take a drink here. 13 month old granddaughter. Well, I'm glad you caught that. And if we want to teach her her colors, what we have to do is, is we have to take two objects that are similar and put them together, only one is yellow and one is red, and we point and we say yellow and we say red until she figures all that out. And we do the same thing with shapes, and she learns to distinguish one thing from another. And she does that same thing with, with people. You distinguish who's family and who's not family, who's mom and dad, who's, who are strangers, um, and, and just all the way down the line, you distinguish the letters. And, and, 
and when we are able to separate those things, then we're able to actually make sense of the world, and, and that's when we can really understand um, what's going on and to be able to actually comprehend the world and to be able to flourish in it. And so this is at a very basic level what God is doing when it comes to creation. He's starting to, to separate things out, okay? And then God does it with living things, and so we see in verse 11, then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees, and on the land that bear fruit and seed in it according to their various kinds. And again, he's, he's dividing them out according to their various kinds. Okay, so he separates the plants, he separates the animals, and then in verse 26, he starts two more uh, very distinctive separations, okay? So verse 26, it says this, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Okay, so we have two more separations here. The first one is that he, he separated humans from all other creatures. Okay, and he did this by making them in the image of God. And so as much as we love animals, we also know that their value is nothing compared to the value of a human being. Um, and it means that, that God made us that in, in some way that we reflect the glory of God in a way that no other creature on earth does. And, and not only that, but and we've talked about this before, but one of the other things that that means is that we have been given a responsibility by God um, and that responsibility we see in verse 28, at least the, the very initial one or, or the basic one that we have, is to fill the earth and subdue it. Right? Now, of course, filling the earth, he's talking about procreation. We're talking about Adam and Eve. We're talking about the first pair, and, uh, and the world needs to be filled. So they're talking about procreation. And this reflects the work of God uh, of creating. Okay? And the second instruction is to subdue the earth, okay? which reflects God's uh, um, bringing order out of chaos, okay? So to subdue the earth is to make sense of it, to, to, to change it in ways that bring about human flourishing. And we do that by, by separating things out and distinguishing between them, setting order um, from chaos, okay? But there's, but there's another separation that happens among humans as well. And we see this in Genesis chapter 2. And so turn with me there, just one page, or maybe it's even on the same page there. But Genesis chapter 2 is actually another account of creation. And it's not one that contradicts the first account, but it actually gives us a little bit different perspective. It sort of zooms in and it focuses more specifically on the creation of, of human beings. And so, for instance, in verse 7, it says that God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Right? And then, um, and we'll look at these next, these next verses, verses next week, verses uh, 8 through 14, but let's skip down to verse 15, and then it says this, the Lord God took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. Okay, so there's that job that he has. You have a responsibility in order to, to take care of Eden. And then skip down to verse 18. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Okay, now up to this point, Everything that he created, he says, has been, has been good, but, um, or very good, actually. But here, this is the first time he says, it is not good. And what he says is, it is not good for the man to be alone. In other words, something is not functioning the way God intended it to function. Adam was alone. And so we get to verse 19, and, uh, and, and God starts to do something about it, all right? Verse 19, now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock and the, uh, the birds in the sky and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. And we've seen that phrase before, suitable helper. Okay? And so here, God basically puts together an object lesson for Adam. He starts to parade all of the animals in front of him, and he does his job. He starts to name. He's distinguishing between the animals, all the species and that. Um, he's fulfilling his duties of, of subduing the earth. And, uh, and it's almost as if God is, pass, is, um, is passing the animals in front of him to say, see if you can find one of these that will help you to accomplish the responsibility that I've given you, 
All right? and, uh, and he goes through the whole list of animals, and he comes to realize that no, in all of the animals, there is no suitable helper. And so then God goes even further, and he does something about it. Verse 21, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and, closed up the pla- uh, um, and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. Now, the translation there, it's oftentimes translated as rib, and uh, people make a lot of that, but that's actually not the anatomical word for it. There's actually a, a word for the um, anatomy. Most commentators, most scholars will say that it actually means side, and many will say that what God did was he actually split the man in half and, and basically said, all right, this side is man, this side is woman, and so you are two halves of, of a whole. Okay, and so this is, this is what uh, Genesis is saying that God did there. And, and so Adam then looked at Eve, and he was so smitten, he decided he needed to write a poem, right? And so he said, roses are red, violets are blue. Now, actually, it doesn't start that way. But verse 23, this is what it says. This is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Aren't you, are you just swooning about that, ladies? I mean, is he a great poet or what, Right? All right, so maybe he needs a little work on his poetry skills, okay? But, but basically what he was saying was, was he was really excited because there was a, now a suitable helper for him. Now, let's look at what that means there, okay? Because those are a couple of very specific Hebrew words. Um, the word helper there is the Hebrew word azer. And, and you know, when you read this in English, you kind of get the sense that, that Adam is the one who has the responsibility, and Eve can be his little helper, can hand him tools and things like that. Okay? That's kind of the sense that you get when you look at the English. But actually, if you look at the Hebrew, that's not really the sense at all. In fact, that word is used many times in the Old Testament, um, and, and most of the time, the word azer refers to God. So, for instance, you see Psalm 46.1, it says, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present azer in trouble. All right, so if you want to work out the implications of that, if we're going to say that there's any kind of imbalance there, I think it's probably describing the woman maybe a little bit higher than the man because she's in the, in the place of God, I guess, right? Um, so anyway, what, but what he's saying is, is that men would not be able to accomplish what God called us to accomplish without women. And, and I would say that this, the reverse is probably true as well, that women would not be able to accomplish what God has called us to comp- accomplish on earth without men. Okay, and so that's what helper means. But then he also uses the word suitable. And that's the, the Hebrew word kenegdo, which is a, a compound word. In other words, it's made out of two words. One of them is neged, which means in front of or opposite. And the other one is, um, is a prefix, which means like or the same as. And so what that word means, it, it means like but different. Okay, they are the same, but they're the opposite. In other words, uh, you might be able to say that they're complementary, um, and, they're, and they're different. In, uh, Eve is different in the sense that she's not like any of the other animals, okay? But, uh, um, uh, but she's like Adam. She's kind of from that same, cut from the same cloth, but she's also different from Adam. And, and there are many ways that we could look at this, but of course, one of the ways is just biologically, anatomically. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but you have, um, you have a, a complete... Um, circulatory system, you have a complete nervous system, you have lots of systems in your body that are complete, but you have half of a reproductive system. Okay? And so this is essentially what it's saying there is. And, and that's not it, okay? but, but that's part of it. At least it at least gives you some, some idea there of what he's talking about there. That there's something about woman that corresponds to the man and that this is the way that God created it. And Adam was excited about this. And it wasn't just because she looked sexy or because she was naked, right? Although that probably had something to do with it. But, but he was excited because God had created a perfect partner for him. Then we move on to verse 24. And it says this. <clears throat> this is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Now, this is why we look at Genesis and say this is the foundation of our understanding of what a family is. And it's an, it's an ideal world, of course, all right? But this is where we get our understanding. And, and the reason that we can do that is, is because we know that this verse is not just describing Adam and Eve. It's not just describing Adam. Where it says, 
Um, this is why a man leaves his father and mother. Well, Adam, Adam didn't have a father and mother to leave, right? And so we know that, this, that they're, he, they're looking at Adam and Eve sort of as archetypes and saying, this is the story that tells us how we operate as a family, that we leave our father and mother and we're united to our, our spouse. And, um, and so, it, yeah, they're archetypes. And it's the, the story is the basis for the most basic unit of society. Okay? The most basic unit of society is not the government, right? The most basic unit of the society is the family. Husband and wife are to form a family to work together to accomplish what God has called us to accomplish, to fill the earth and to subdue it, okay? And then in verse 25, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Now, this is a, a metaphor for perfect intimacy, and uh, there's nothing in between them. They work together in harmony to accomplish what God wanted. A and notice that it's not any longer man and, uh, man and woman. It's actually husband and wife that it's describing there, okay? So this isn't a random hookup, right? This is, this is a committed family relationship. It's describing marriage in the ideal world. Now, we know that we don't live in the ideal world. Okay? We live in a fallen world, and, and we'll get to that more. We'll talk about that more next week because that's an important thing for us to remember. But what I want to do is I want to stop here today, <clears throat> and I want to apply. I want to see what kind of things we can, we can take away from what we learn just from Genesis chapters 1 and 2. And, and I think I'll do it. I'll talk about five things, all right? And uh, I don't want anyone saying, careful, watch it, all right? There might be some things that are controversial, but um, let me just tell you this. My email is printed in the bulletin, and I would love to get emails from you, all right? <clears throat> now, we're actually going to be talking about some things where, and, and maybe a lot of this, if you're a part of the older generation, you'll say, okay, so of course, this is, you know, what's so, what's so revolutionary about this, all right? But the truth of the matter is, is if you're someone who is probably 30 or younger, 35 or younger, then these are things that you're wrestling with because this is the world that you live in, okay? Because these things that we talk about from Scripture are not things that are clear in society. There's so much confusion and so much chaos about what all of this stuff means, and it's not just about the rules. It's just about the foundation of who are we as, as human beings, and so these are important things for us to remember, and, uh, and so if you're of the older generation, understand that some of these things are actually pretty controversial in today's world. Um, and, uh, and so understand that maybe as you're talking with your kids or your grandkids or, or whatever, okay? All right, so the first thing, first takeaway that we have from this is, is that men and women are created different, right? I just blew your mind, didn't I? All right, I know, profound, okay? Well, actually, I have to say that. I have to say that because there are some people who believe that there is no difference between men and women, that there might be some differences in plumbing and things like that, but really it's only incidental. And, and in fact, there are some people who would say that there actually is no gender binary, okay? So that gender is not just male and female, it actually runs along a, a continuum. And, uh, but, the, but the creation account in Genesis tells us that men and women are different, but, and that, that difference is the foundation of the most basic organizing principle of our society. Um, in fact, you could say that sexual difference is really the only difference that God created in humanity. Okay, the rest, we, we can create lots of other ones. We create racial differences, class differences, nationality, but, but gender and sex is the only one that is actually created by God. And it's intended not to separate us, but it's actually intended to, to bring us together. Kind of like, uh, like, like magnets, you know, a positive and a negative charge are different, but that doesn't, br that doesn't separate them. It actually brings them together. This is the way uh, men and women are intended to, to be, okay? The sex act itself is something that creates uh, a bond among difference, okay? Um, and so men and women are created different, but we also have to remember that men and women are created equal, Right? And again, I have to say this because this has not always been readily apparent to people throughout history. Nowhere in Genesis does it say that the man is better than the woman or more important or more valuable than the woman. It's critical for us to remember this, okay? Um, because throughout history, 
We've, uh, rather than treating our differences as equal and complementary, oftentimes we've tended to value men more than women. And so in the past, we've believed that women aren't as smart as men. We've denied women the right to vote. We've denied them positions of leadership, told them that women's place is only in the home. And, uh, and, and oftentimes, men only view women for their sexuality, that that's their really only usefulness in the world. And, and this is not biblical, and we cannot do this. Okay, that men and women are created equal. And, and one of the reasons this happens is, is that we tend to overemphasize sex differences all right, between men and women. Um, studies do show that there are physical and, fi and uh, psychological differences between men and women. And, and most studies show that there are a combination of both biological and societal factors that, that play into that. And so it's not just one thing that creates these differences. Um, uh, but these differences aren't absolute, they're on average, is what you can say about most of these things. So really a, a clear picture of this is, um, is that the average man is taller than the average woman. But there are also many women who are taller than men. Okay? And you can, you, you can do that in, for just about any trait. Okay? The same thing is true for how our brains are wired. Women on average are more nurturing than men. Men on average are more aggressive and risk-taking. Men, on average, are more interested in, in STEM professions and engineering, and, and yet, in this congregation, we have Karen Rogers, for instance, who got an engineering degree from MIT, is the head of an engineering department at Bethel, and I've never seen her engineer anything, but I have a pretty good idea that she's pretty good at what she does, right? And so we can't use those averages to, to stereotype people and say, well, you could never do this. And I think it's great if, if we want to encourage women to go into STEM because they haven't historically because of stereotypes, then great. I don't know that we'll ever reach a 50-50 you know, thing in STEM. I, I don't know. I guess we'll, we'll find out. But I don't think there's anything wrong with, uh, with encouraging women to do things that they traditionally have not. Our society is changing greatly and, uh, and, and that's opening up a lot of possibilities for women, okay? Now today, there actually is, is sort of an equally dangerous attitude than devaluing women because in much of our Western society today, there's actually an underlying devaluing of men. And this is something that we don't talk about very much. There are all kinds of programs to help girls, um, but study after study shows more and more, especially in school, that young boys are being left behind. Okay, we, we center our, our education system on how the way girls learn primarily, and so a lot of boys are just checking out. Um, it's really easy for people today, especially with all the Me Too stuff, to, to lump in all men with the creeps that are perpetrating sexual assault, saying all men are pervert, perverts. Uh, many women think that men should just be more like women, and if that were the case, then the world would be a much better place. Um, dads on TV are still oftentimes portrayed as incompetent buffoons, okay? See, men and women are equal and need to be able to appreciate the unique gifts that are available in people because they are sexed, but also just because they're individuals, that God has created each of us to be unique. And this, uh, this brings us to our third takeaway, and it's this. The Bible doesn't proscribe strict gender roles. The Bible doesn't prescribe strict gender roles. Now, I've been using two terms throughout the sermon that actually are, are similar, but they're different. One of them is, is sex. And when I talk about sex, I'm talking about biology, I'm talking about you male or female. But there's also another word that I've been using that is related, but, but actually a little bit different, and that's the word gender. Okay? Now, there are some people, and, and gender is basically how we live out our maleness or femaleness um, within society, not just with uh, not just with a spouse, but all throughout society, because how you interact, if you're a man, how you interact with other men is probably different than the way you interact with women. At least, yeah, they, it probably is. Um, but there are some people who would say that no, gender has nothing to do with biological sex. I think they're tied together. I think it provides an anchor point. Um, but but that being said, I don't think that gender is is something that we need to hold people, uh, that, that the gender roles are not something that we need to hold people rigidly to, okay? Um, and, and part of that is, is because the, the world has changed a lot, all right? 
Um, for instance, in, in ancient times and in traditional societies, there was no birth control, um, people tended to have large families, um, and besides, um, large families were necessary to be able to run a family business, and a lot of the businesses were actually run out of the home. And so it was necessary because of this to always have someone who would stay home and nurture the children. And, and we know that because of some biological differences that most often women are the ones to do that. When it comes to newborn, it, it was necessary. It had to be so just because of the biology of it. And, uh, and, and so there, it just necessitated that. Most of the work that had to be done was hard physical labor that required you know, great strength. And so that was the role that men fell into at that time as well. It was, it was out of necessity. Okay? But like I said, things are different today. Okay, women are still tied biologically to newborns uh, because of things like breastfeeding. And, uh, um, and, and in fact, if one part of a couple is going to stay home with a baby, it's very true that more women will prefer to be the ones to stay home with the baby. Not always, but sometimes they do. But in our society today, the vast majority of women do work outside the home at least part-time, and the majority of them actually work full-time. And, and today, more women get college degrees than men, and the Bible doesn't say anything against that at all. It doesn't say that that's a bad thing, okay? Um, although, it, that, I think that does say something about the state of men in our society today, okay? I mean, ideally, you would want that to be a little bit more equal, but, but I think in, in many ways, because we devalue men, that uh, these, some of these things are happening. But, but even beyond... Um, healthy nurturing of children. The Bible doesn't tell women that they need to be the ones to cook and to clean and to do laundry and the guy should do all the household repairs. In fact, I know many couples where that role is, is switched, you know, that the wife is very handy and she does those sorts of things and that's great, okay? And we can expect that men and women will follow certain trends in society just because of the way we're wired on average, but we shouldn't force it. If a mom wants to be a stay-at-home mom, then awesome. If she wants to be a CEO, then that's great too, all right? And that includes in the church. The Wesleyan Church is what we call an egalitarian um, denomination, which means that we believe that both men and women are gifted for ministry. Um, we are one of the first denominations to ordain women and have always believed that women can hold any position in the church that they want to, teaching, preaching, leading, anything. And so we don't limit that, and I think that's the way it should be, okay? So... Um, Men and women are created different, they're created equal, and we shouldn't force people into strict gender roles. Fourth, marriage is not just between two people. Okay, now, there are a couple of ways that you can go with this. Of course, you could uh, do it because there are a lot of people saying um, that, that marriage is two people, meaning it's not, it doesn't have to be man and woman. I believe, I believe that it does. Okay? Uh, but but the, where I'm going with it here is that Genesis shows us that marriage is actually a societal issue. So it's not just between the two of you, all right? Um, healthy, intact marriages and healthy families are the best bargain for human flourishing, okay? God knew what he was doing when he was creating families. Children grow up far healthier and well-adjusted when they grow up with their mom and their dad. They're more secure in their identity. They're less likely to experience poverty, do drugs, drop out of school, um, and a load of all kinds of other things, okay? Families that are together are really the best bargain that society has. And I think things like welfare are necessary and, and uh, in many ways they're good things, but really family is the best bargain that society has for flourishing. But I also know that we don't live in an ideal world. Life is messy. Um, and so if you've lost a spouse or if you've been a part of a marriage that's failed or you know, something has happened, you're you know, maybe you've adopted or something like that, those are amazing things, okay? And, and the reason that you do that is because you know how important family is. And so, you know, because we don't live in a fallen world, they can't always look the way we want them to. And, uh, and if you've been part of, of a broken family or something like that, I don't want you to despair, and I don't want you to beat yourself up about it, okay? But I do want you to understand um, that, that through the grace of God, and through a supportive extended family or a supportive church family, that, that you can do it, that you can, that you can make the best of everything that you have and still be able to accomplish what God has called us to accomplish. Okay? Finally, in Genesis, 
we see that marriage has a purpose beyond just two people loving each other. All right? And what I mean by this is that our society has bought into marriage as the sort of romance-focused marriage. Okay, we get together because we're physically attracted and there are sparks that fly and the sex is great and, and all of that. And for a lot of people, the primary purpose of marriage is to fulfill you sexually and to make you happy with your soulmate forever. And I just have to say, I, I don't want to disappoint you, but this is not the biblical story of marriage. All right? Yes, I do hope that romance is a part of your marriage. I hope that you do find fulfillment in it. You know, read the Song of Solomon. So the Bible's not against it, all right? But it's a lousy foundation for marriage. The foundation for your marriage has to be something outside of just the marriage itself. And the best way to sabotage your marriage is to make your marriage the point of your marriage, right? So you understand that God brought Adam and Eve together to be able to accomplish a purpose, okay? Uh, to accomplish something in society, and, uh, and if you have children, then part of that purpose is for you guys to work together to raise your children to know and to love Jesus. And you can have purposes outside of that too, but for a while, that's going to be your primary purpose. If you're married and you don't have children, you have a purpose as well, and your purpose may be a little bit more open, but it extends beyond your marriage, okay? You and your spouse together can accomplish some things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to accomplish alone. And so what, one of the things that I would encourage you to do is if you've never thought about it before, just talk about it in your, in your marriage and say, say okay, if, if we are brought together in order to accomplish something that we couldn't accomplish alone, what is that? What is it that our marriage can uniquely accomplish that in 30, 40, 50 years from now, we can look back and we say, yeah, we did a pretty good job there. And when you have that common purpose and when you, when you see yourselves as teammates rather than just staring at each other all of the time, um, then it starts to give you more purpose and can even give you more life in your marriage. So I would encourage you to ask yourself those questions. Well, that's, um, that's really all the time that we have for today as, as far as this is concerned. Um, but of course, if you have any questions for me, if, there are any, if there's anything throughout this series that you would like to, to touch on, we're going to talk about issues um, like singleness, we're going to talk about pornography, we're going to talk about you know, a number of other things. It, it's really hard. This could be like a 30-week series because there are so many subplots um, to these types of things. But I wanted to just give you a little foundation today for us to be able to think about it, to start to talk about it. And, uh, and we'll continue on with some of these more specific things. Um, I've also listed some resources, and I'll do this every week, some resources, some books for you to, uh, to be able to read that, that sort of expounds on some of the things that I've talked about that particular week. Um, but it's something that we absolutely have to talk about um, because in our society today and even in the church, we are so confused and we're dealing with so much hurt, and we're dealing with so much brokenness, and so many people are, are trying to heal from wounds of the past. Maybe it's something that they've done and they're ashamed of it, or maybe it's something that's happened to them, some sort of abuse or assault or things. Um, these are things that we need to talk about. We can't be private about them because they impact our lives in such a, such a big way, and they impact our society in such, a, in such a big way. And so as a church, we need to have a way forward, we need to have a clear picture of what God calls us to in the areas of sex and gender and sexuality. I'm not going to be able to answer all the questions that you have about it, and probably it'll bring up even more questions, okay? But I think it's important for us to talk about because God made it a big part of who we are. Let's pray. God, we thank you for today, and we thank you for the opportunity to, to talk about things that are, that, well, probably most of us don't really even want to talk about. We would rather just sweep things under the rug. We would rather talk about things that everyone agrees on um, and things that don't cause so much pain and hurt and heartache in our lives, like, uh, like the issue of sex and family. And, uh, and Lord, I want to just pray today for anyone in here who is, who is struggling either with confusion um, about what they should believe about any of this kind of stuff. I want to pray especially for those who are struggling with past hurts, um, whether it's something that they did, something that they did to someone else and they're ashamed of, or 
um, something that was perpetrated against them, that they've been abused or used or, or whatever. And so, God, I just pray that you would be working to heal the hurts of, of people who are, of who are hurting. And I pray that you would give us clarity, that you would give us grace, and that you would give us hope as we, uh, as we talk about these difficult issues. Thank you so much that you are a God who, who became one of us, who knows what it's like to be a person, who knows what it's like to have a body, who knows what it's like to be tempted in the same ways that we are, who knows what it's like to, to lose loved ones, who knows what it's like to, to deal with all of these issues. And so, God, I pray that we would just um, rely